Hello. Hi. Hey, Sarah. Um, oh, and Tina's here too. Mutes, gonna... the mutes. There we go. Here we go. There we go. Way. Oh, look, you've got a cool background. <laughs> Is that, did you do that with Zoom? Did you do like yeah. a Zoom? Yeah. I hope it's not too distracting. I can go on and turn it off if it is, but you know, it thought it was quite appropriate for tonight. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't played around. I saw the message, you know, that you can do backgrounds, yeah. but I haven't done that yet, but that looks quite fun. Hi, Tina. Hi. Hello. <laughs> All right, so now what I wanna do, so it said that I should be able to have a way to put this right into Facebook. Ah, yeah, live on Facebook. Oh yeah. my God. I know this is new territory because it's funny, you know, Heather, as you, as you literally, as you emailed me on that day, I was looking at how I could do Facebook lives and trying to figure it out. And yeah. I was actually trying to figure out how to make my zoom do this. And then your email mm -hmm. arrived and I was like, well, there you go. There you see, it was meant to be now choose yeah. where you want to post your live video. I don't want to share it on my timeline, share in a group. There you go. How much fun is this? And it's so easy. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh, excellent. You, uh, do you think you do could one a, tell? should do one a week? Yeah. Well, we've got Michael Ratty coming up on Monday. I'm going to announce that. And then um, Brigitte is going to do something next week too. And I've just kind of been emailing. I don't have any kind of method to it. Just as people, as people come to my mind, I think, oh, I think I'll email. It is, by the way. <laughs> this is my Friday. I only have one glass of alcohol a week and this is it, Friday evening. Really, look at that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Oh, it disappears, look. It disappears into Hampton Court Palace. That's, <laughs> that's very strange. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so funny preparing live streaming preview okay well right. i better behave no 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 that's <laughs> no don't <not>. behave <laughs> don't behave <laughs> what would be the point of behaving <laughs> yeah we're all going stir crazy so we might as well just uh, let it out <laughs> i mean friday night <laughs> time to party yeah right <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly all right so i think do, 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 do. People are, I don't, yeah, I don't know how many people are going to use that link and come here versus going on Facebook. So we'll just, I'll have both open. Okay. And check questions and stuff. I'll have my Facebook on the bottom or mm -hmm. on my tablet, and then I'll have the Zoom on my, on my computer. Okay. It's taking a long time to think. I love that. That is, I'm just looking at your background. That is so great. The thing is, I use this for, for my other work as well. And I must remember not to turn up on one of my other teleconferences with Hampton Court in the background. Well, you might enjoy that. <laughs> like, okay, Sarah, <laughs> what relevance does this have? Well, there's a lot of relevance to... to not um, not to organizational and team development, I suspect. I would not. I mean, when you look at how you're going to talk about it and Woolsey and how he managed his team and how Henry managed his, I mean, don't you think you could get something out of that? Yeah, it has been said, you know, do it says if something on leadership and Henry VIII and map it across and no, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's a business book in there for you. I think I actually went to um, a lecture by David Starkey actually about that topic many years ago about a decade decade or plus ago but he was he was at one of the london business schools doing exactly exactly that i think it was actually an excuse to sell his book about the young henry the eighth you know but hey ho i think i don't think people just do that out of the goodness of their heart i don't know so i'm just waiting for it to give me the confirmation that i'm live on facebook um, and it's just taking forever. It's like, I've just got this little screen here that is circling around and circling around. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll start asking you questions. And uh, we'll see who else, who else joins or does. Tina, 
Tina, yeah. what do you do exactly? Because you said you're a healthcare worker. What What well, is your healthcare working? It's ther it's therapy. Technically, I'm retired, but I came semi out of retirement just to mm -hmm. help out running skill groups. It's psychosocial rehab, so okay. it's mostly group work. Yeah. So that's what I was referencing. But yeah. thank you again for the uh, offer. And you see, oh, I yeah. bought some. I bought something else this morning. <laughs> I did. I, did. I, I don't yeah. know how long it's good for, but I appreciate it. <laughs> it's your own personal thing, right? I'll just Yay! Keep <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's still circling around, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to, let's see. Maybe it's yeah. like actually on and it just hasn't told me yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go in and dive in and see. I am. It's just, it's just circle. I just have a black screen that's circling around um and we're taping this too so you know i'll send i'll put it up and send you a link and yeah you can put it places and everything yeah, yeah. Um, well these nobody things, else on zoom wow nobody no wow um it's just yeah. the three of us <laughs> it is, it's, <laughs> i'll get all my questions answered yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> There you go. And uh, let's see. Yeah. And, and it says, I don't know, because it says stop live stream. So this is going to be really funny if actually we are live streaming right now. Let me go into my group. Maybe that's like, it's not going to give me anything. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't tell. I, yeah, it's just, I think I am. I think I am live. <laughs> this is really funny because it's just like, it's just a black screen that says go live on Facebook and it says broadcast app, you know, sources, Zoom, blah, 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 all of that. And then if I go back into Zoom, I thought, well, maybe I'll shut it off and then turn it back on. And so I tried to do that and it said, it just said stop live stream. So I suspect we actually are live streaming on Facebook. So that's fun. So <laughs> to people on Facebook, you got to just hear our fun conversation there we had. And I see Carol Ann came on as well. So Carol Ann, I am going to uh, write back properly to your email this afternoon, evening. Um, and that's very exciting. So welcome to Carol Ann as well. Um, okay, so I wanted this to be a totally casual just chit chat and it's turning out to be totally casual chit chat. It so is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the technology's doing stuff. I don't know if I'm live or not. I got no idea. But we're hanging out. <laughs> so um, Sarah Morris is yes. the tour travel guide. Thank you so much for being here and for you know taking the time out of your quarantine schedule. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, my social calendar is exceptionally busy at the moment, darling. <laughs> yes, is it? Well, I want to ask you. Oh. <laughs> um, how are you? How are you handling quarantine? And are you thinking at all about uh, plague? And uh, are, are you getting a vis some visions of how the tutors were handling plagues and things like that? Yeah, certainly I am. So uh, how am I handling it? I think I'm handling it fine. I did have to move house. I've now moved in with my partner. This is not where I'm living. She says, pointing <laughs> to the building behind me. Um, but uh, it did involve me. It was actually, um, do you guys get desert island discs or anything similar? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I had to grab my top 10 books as I left my library behind me to come and move mm. my new study here. And it was quite interesting to see which books I grabbed. <laughs> um, so I am feeling a bit bereft of all my normal resources because writing is continuing as normal. And uh, I've already realized there's a couple I've left behind that I'd, I'd really like to bring mm. along. And as for plague and pestilence and the sweat it's interesting because i'm recording a podcast for my june episode of the tudor travel show and it's actually the theme is cromwell and i'm talking to Callum, carol carol mcgrath who uh, studied cromwell um when she was doing her na in history and she's she's written a novel from his wife's point of view but okay. uh, one of the things she, we were talking about what we were going to chat about today and one of the things she said is you must ask me about the sweat and Thomas Cromwell because of course he lost I think his wife yeah. and, and two daughters so um so I, I was thinking about that today actually um, mm -hmm. and and I think that we are in so many ways very lucky that we're not having to face something quite as virulent as the sweat yeah yeah definitely uh, um 
So I want to just ask you briefly, kind of have you introduce yourself and your work. Um, you are the tutor travel guide. And so tell me how you got into places and wanting to, to write about and research places and, and kind of what you do with that. Yeah, I mean, it's a crazy long story, really. So, I mean, it, it goes right back to my childhood when literally, literally every summer, every weekend, my mum and dad would drag me around England looking at National Trust properties. And, and that's how we spent, that's how I spent my most of my childhood. And, and, mm. and I often think I could have either really rebelled and never wanted to see another historic property again in my life, or, <laughs> or I was going to fall in love with it. And, and it was the latter, thankfully. Um, and I've always enjoyed, you know, I love, one of the things I, I absolutely love about England is this, its historic landscape. And I still do that to this day, um, go and visit <laughs> places. But I suppose it was all fairly latent until I started writing my first book, which was a novel about Anne Boleyn. And right. um, I was determined to do as much historical accuracy as possible, Heather. So... I started researching a lot of aspects of Tudor life, which I didn't really know that much about. It was really starting from scratch. And mm. one of the things I started researching was the places, which of course are the backdrop to all these incredible events. And, mm. and I soon found myself falling completely in love with these places. And there was nothing better than to kind of get a map or a, you know, reconstructive drawing and try to figure out where certain events happened. Yeah. And if I could then actually go along and stand in that room, for example, the uh, Garter Throne Room at Windsor Castle, I, I realized through the course of my research was the place in which Anne was made Marquess of Pembroke. And I, mm. I was so excited that um, I could actually go and stand in this space, you know, um, as you will know, and, and, but, but some people may not, the research from that novel led to a love of places and writing about Tudor places. And then I, I hooked up with my uh, Tudor co-conspirator, Natalie Gruniger, and we both rewrote the two in the footsteps books. Mm. And um, that just deepened my interest further. Um, so, so yeah, I, you know, we both said that the thing about visiting a historic place is, is it's, you can, when you're there, it is literally only time and not space, which separates you. So you can touch the walls, you can feel the energy of a place. And um, Natalie and I used to, you know, go around researching stuff for the Anne Boleyn book. We go, we look at each other whenever we felt the vibe, you know, it's that sense that, that you can, you can just feel the history. Yeah. Um, so there you go. And then the Tudor Travel Guide was born um, about two years ago. So this brought all this together. And I really wanted to create this online hub, this place, mm -hmm. which was a resource for people who wanted to learn about and wanted to visit Tudor locations. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what the Tudor Travel Guide is all about. And I blog, I research, I blog, I have a YouTube channel and I do the podcast, uh, the Tudor yes. Travel and we'll mention this again at the end too, but if people go to your website, you've got some really cool free guides and things like that too, that people can download. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So tell me where today you're talking about what's in the backdrop there, Hampton Court. Can you mm. tell me a little bit about the history of Hampton Court? And I know there's like, I remember seeing the ads on the underground, two palaces in one and, you know, come and <laughs> All of that. And, and so without going necessarily into the more modern part, what can you tell me about the, the Tudor period? And yeah, the schizophrenic palace. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks to an outbreak of smallpox. So then again, another case of pestilence. We still have half of the Hampton Court left because mm -hmm. if it wasn't for that, William and Mary, who were the then king and queen, would have continued their modernization and we may well have lost the whole palace. So um, it was obviously sad that Mary, Queen Mary died, but it left us with half a, pa a Tudor palace to enjoy. So, um, so you know, one of the things you said, Heather, was don't prep for this, just turn up. So um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that I've remembered everything as reasonably correctly as possible. Um, I think the original site was, was, was had links to the Knights Templar and then um, was this um, do 
dude called uh, um, who was a, a rich city London merchant who who built a manor house and it was a moated manor house mm. at the time and and if I remember correctly it's Wolsey who bought that purchased that off Sir Giles and he began constructing the Hampton Court that we know today um, and you know a massive um, building program to expand what was a manor house into a palace. Uh, Woolsey had, you know, grand aspirations on the European stage. He wanted to be taken seriously as a major player in, mm -hmm. in you know, in European politics. And, and he wanted to entertain ambassadors and dignitaries. And so, and of course, the monarch, Henry VIII, Catherine of Barragan, as was, and so, you know, he set about this massive building campaign and, and started um, increasing the privy lodgings and he built galleries, he built all the kitchen area, you know, he built the chapel, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. he created this magnificent palace, did away with the moat, of course, the moat today, of course, is nowhere to be seen. So um, created this magnificent palace, which really was, you know, a jewel in the crown. And as we all know the story, um, Henry loved beautiful things and <laughs> wanted the best and fell in love with Wolsey's palace and basically wrangled it off him and um, took it over for himself. And hence, of course, it became a Tudor royal palace that was lived in by all the Tudor monarchs. And, and of course, that it's, it's really the only palace that is accessible, that, was, that is so distinctively Tudor. And that's what makes it just so unbelievably special. Mm. And it had a number of kind of mod cons, didn't it? Uh, there was like a when Woolsey was doing his building projects, like the, the kitchens and the privy, and I, weren't there like a number of things that were really quite modern with it? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that the the, the Garderone ra range is is quite something else, isn't it? Because as you approach the gatehouse, which again I think was. Well, first of all, you remember that Hampton Court was built in brick and, and at the turn of the 16th century, that was quite a novel a building material. Mm. It was only really just coming into England and to be used as a building material. So I suppose in that respect, it was even a trendsetter. Um, mm. And then he built this magnificent gatehouse, um, which of course was, was two stories higher than we see today. The, the current structure became unstable and top two stories were taken down I think in the 18th century um, but of course over to your right as you stand looking at the gatehouse you've got this range of buildings and um, that was the whole garderobe range uh, so this whole range of privies which is really weird to us isn't it to think of everybody just sitting in a line <laughs> uh, going, going to the loo but yeah I mean um, I mean I think it all just went into the moat which is why they had to regularly leave the palace so that the whole place not just the moat but of course people relieve themselves in various corners of the palace and and actually if you go today and have a look round in some of the nooks and crannies you can see these like semi-circular iron things in the corners and I didn't know what they were, but they were literally, and I don't know when they were inserted. I'm not claiming that they're authentic Tudor, but it was essentially to try and keep people away from peeing uh, in the corner. Uh, <laughs> so um, anyway, have we got, how have we got onto this? Um, but, um, so yeah, it's, um, and of course he built this fabulous um, privy lodging reigns for the King, for Catherine mm -hmm. and for the Princess Mary. Um, and that privy uh, lodging range is in the second courtyard as you go under the Amberlin gateway into Clock Court. It faces mm -hmm. you directly. It's been, it's been much meddled with over time. But that's actually one of my just absolute favourite places of the palace because I have this thing about lost buildings and things that have been lost. I, my imagination just wants to recreate them. And mm -hmm. so if I get little clues, I, I just want to I want to be able to kind of piece it all together, which is what I've done a lot of um, with regards to the royal lodgings at Hampton Court. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you talked about the clock and I, above your head. That was another feature that was really unique to Hampton Court. Yeah. What can you yeah. tell me about the clock? 
Yeah, I think it was Nicholas Kranzer uh, who built that. I mean, he was, I think, the, you know, the king's clockmaker. It's qu quite, I mean, you, you know, do do pitch in, Heather, if you know more about okay. it. Please, please do pitch no, I just, in. I did an episode on clocks and well, time there you go. I just remember that that clock, like, told all the tides and, like, you could That's look right. at it and it had, like, the, the, the cycles of the moon and when the moon was going to be in, in uh, Libra or, I don't know, all these different things that you could tell. From and of course, it's, it's right above my head here, isn't it? So yeah. we've got it there. But I think that, you know, there's a couple of things interesting about that. Apparently it's signed. So his name is on that clock. Um, and above it, I don't know whether people listening are, are aware, but there is a bell above, you know, it's a, the, the bell, there is a bell. Um, and that bell is the oldest thing in Hampton Court Palace. It was there when the original Knights Templar building was there. So it's, it has the same bell has been chiming day in, day out over hundreds of years. And that kind of blows my mind. I think that's amazing because you know, when you're there at Hampton Court and you hear it, ting, 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 you're thinking, this is what people heard. This is what they yeah. actually heard when they were going about their daily business and they keep the rhythms of court. But I want to say mm -hmm. one more thing about that clock, Heather, before we, you know, before we maybe move on. Um, and it actually ties back to what we were just talking about, about the lost privy apartments of Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the beautiful things about writing in a book is you get into all the nooks and crannies of places that you might not otherwise manage to do. And I got into the space that was once part of Henry's presence chamber, which is today a training room. Uh, I mean, it, it's totally, the walls have been messed with, the floor levels have been messed with. There's, n you know, it's just a plain room with, you know, tables and chairs in it. But the window that faces the clock survives. And what, and it, it's curious, isn't it? Because the moment I stood there, I kind of realized, so here we have ambassadors coming to see Henry in his presence chamber. We have important people who maybe need to get back to London and they can look out of the window and see the clock and see if the tide is about to change and whether they need to get their stuff together and get yeah. out and get a barge, you know, and you kind of start to, it's those little bits that you kind of start to feel how, how, the, how it worked, how life at court worked. And that was mm. really quite exciting. Oh, that's so cool. That's so yeah. cool. I love that. Oh, and by um, the way, sorry, I have to say something else. By yeah. the way, the window here, that window you can see me pointing to, it's below the clock. Mm -hmm. I, I see you learn all the time. So uh, I was when I one of the very recent visits to Hampton Court, I met with uh, Tracy Borman, who's currently the co-curator at Hampton Court. And she told me that Anne Boleyn's rooms uh, that she used before she became queen were those rooms just below that clock. And wow. and I thought we didn't know. I knew Anne Boleyn had chambers at Hampton Court. Um, but I, I was under the impression until that point that we didn't know exactly where they were, but no, Tracy was very clear that they are up there. So that's my next ambition, by the way, <laughs> is to gain entry to those rooms. <laughs> that would make an amazing YouTube vlog. Wouldn't it? <laughs> Who would like to see that? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like and subscribe to Sarah on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. Normally when I get my site set on something one way or another, <laughs> eventually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> eventually um, it comes to pass. <laughs> um, so you wanted to talk, um, well, you wanted to talk about the rooms that you can visit, what you can visit, what you can't. And then I wanted to also ask you um, about like the haunted gallery and stuff like that. So um, we've still got a little, a couple more things here to go over. So what would you like to chat about in terms of like tips for people visiting? Um, you know, also if people are visiting from the US and or they haven't been to London before, they might not be aware that it's not like right in London, but it's yeah. close. And like, what kind of tips can you give for people who are visiting Hampton Court? Yeah, okay. So, um, I mean, it isn't right in central London. You're right. You know, you've got central London and then it's on the west of London. Mm -hmm. It's kind of on the way out to Windsor Castle. Of course, it's on the river. Um, and um, 
you know, that's of course how the Tudors would have moved from central London to Hampton Court, on to Windsor, down the river. Um, but it's even, you can do that today, but the actual ride on the boat, I've not done it myself because it is literally takes apparently hours to do it. So um, I haven't tried that myself, but over the bridge from Hampton Court. So once you get to East Mosley train station, it's really, you know, it's literally a matter of a few minutes to get mm -hmm. to Hampton Court. Um, sorry, I'm, my, I'm telling me my internet connection is unstable, which is making me slightly nervous. So I hope it all just continues. <laughs> okay. Um, you, or you can drive, you know, if you are, if you have hired a car, there is car parking on site. So you can do that. One of my tips is just to, let's start at the beginning, is to get there early. Um, I think it opens at, I think gates open at 11. Um, the chime chimes that I was telling you about, the gates swing open. And I always like to get there early. And one of the reasons I like to do that is I kind of like to get ahead of the crowd. I, I tend to go straight through base court because most people, when you go through the gateway, you enter into base court, which again, you know, is, was fairly innovative. We were talking about innovations. Woolsey had this fabulous lodging range, um, lodging court built um, with these double sort of double um, apartments, if you like, um, with all the mod cons for the time. But anyway, I tend to go straight through base court uh, and straight through to the great hall because there is something amazing about walking into that great hall. You go up those steps and it's like ghosts surpassing you on the stairs. I mean, if you have a vivid imagination, as I do, um, you know, you feel the ghost brush past you and then you walk into the great hall. And if you can get there before the crowds, you have the place to yourself, with the exception maybe of the, the warden who is, is, you know, stationed in each room. And I... I just mm. think when you can have that room to yourself, it's one of the most energetically potent, I think, Tudor rooms that I've been in. Um, it's obviously hung with tapestries, which were part of Henry's collection. And although we've lost all the opulent painting, you know, the ceiling would have been painted blue and red and gold and the floor would have been tiled, it would have been much brighter in colour than we see today, it still has this incredible energy. And when you, you manage to get there ahead of the crowd, you can really just just allow yourself to feel that. So that's one of the things that I, I really like to do. Um, I think the other thing is to um, go in search of some of these lost features. At least this is what interests me, Heather. You know, as I say, it's the kind of uh, things that are not so obvious, things that they don't really talk about in the guidebooks. And I suppose that's the thing I really like bringing people's attention to. And if you leave the great hall and go into the great watching chamber, which is the next chamber along. And of course the great watching chamber was as the name suggests, the place where people watched and waited, waited to try and get an audience with the King. And it was also used for dining of high status members of, of the King's household during the day. And, sometimes celebratory occasions. But as you walk through directly on your right, there is a doorway and, um, and that doorway is actually just behind it, it's just a brick wall. So the doors are there, but there's just a brick wall. But that, is, that was the where you would have gone if you wanted to progress through and actually have an audience with Henry in the presence chamber, which lay beyond. And um, as I say, you can't get in there. But for many, many years when I visited Hampton Court, I had no idea about that. And, it, and for me, it's when you start to be able to know some of these little details that you build up a more colorful, complete picture of, of how the palace would have once looked. And um, unfortunately from that, you know, you can't progress into the presence chamber, but you know, and people who know me well have probably probably fed up of me talking about this. But um, for those of you who haven't heard me talk about this, you can actually pick up Henry's apartments later on in the tour. So 
in today's tour, you would you you would progress through into uh, one of the galleries that takes you down to the old council chamber, and then on to the haunted gallery, which you mentioned, and the holy day closets. And we can come we can come back and and talk about those. Um, but if you continue on in the journey and go through to the baroque the baroque part of the palace, you will find yourself coming across something called the Cumberland Suite at some point. And today it's used as a, an art gallery. Um, and there's, a, there's one room which the first room you go into in the Cumberland Street Suite was actually, and, and I know this because I poured over the maps, was originally part of Henry's Privy Chamber. So you're kind of going round where the presence chamber would be you can't go through because originally you would have gone great watching chamber presence chamber privy chamber bed chamber secret rooms and it just would have all been in a straight line but because the palace has been messed with so much you can't do that now but you do pick up henry's private rooms later on in the cumberland suite and um I remember coming across this because when i was researching and writing the book i had all the plans of hampton court out and I went to visit Hamden Corner. I had <laughs> plans with me and, and I suddenly walked into the Cumberland Suite. Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm actually in Henry's privy or part of Henry's privy chamber. And then the room goes into a very narrow corridor. And, and this is actually quite an important Tudor feature uh, that has survived. So there was an airlock between usually the either the presence chamber and the privy chamber or in this case i think the privy chamber and the bed chamber and beyond it was kind of going into henry's inner sanctum and only the most favored courtiers friends guests would be allowed beyond that point and the, the first time I went with all these maps in hand and, and I, I was having this epiphany and going, oh my God, I'm standing in his privy chamber and, and this is his bedchamber. I, I grabbed one of the guides who was in the room and said, this is why things happening. Is that right? And he said, oh, let me show you something. So he takes me back down this little corridor and opens this door that leads off this little narrow, narrow little short corridor and goes, this is the staircase that used, that led down to the king's privy wardrobe. And the original ste wooden steps are there and they go down to the ground floor. It's a spiral staircase. And they usually keep that door closed. So you normally can't see it. And this is my next tip, unless you ask. If you ask really nicely in the Cumberland suite and say, is there any chance of seeing, you know, inside the, seeing behind this door that went down to the original privy wardrobe? So far, so far, bless their hearts, they have, um, they have um, obliged. Um, and in fact, today, interestingly enough, the, the, if you go, if you're not allowed down that spiral staircase, but it actually comes out on the ground floor where you stay your, where you store your um, buggies, push chairs. And, yeah. and stuff. So actually you can see the foot of the stairs going up How funny! if you know where to look. Yeah. Um, and anyway, at the end, beyond, beyond that little corridor, you enter into um, this, the room which was Henry's bedchamber, private bedchamber. It's totally Georgianized now, but there's one little clue, Heather, that's in the far corner. If you look, you'll see a typical Tudor doorway you know the iconic Tudor arch that we we're all so familiar with and it's blocked up I love these blocked doorways and and again this guide on the day I was there said oh and by the way that's the door that used to connect Henry's bedroom with Wolsey's privy apartments mm -hmm. so again my you know my my imagination was like wow Oh, you know, so you could just imagine Woolsey appearing through his this private passageway and coming into Henry's bedchamber and he's getting ready and, you know, he's getting ready in the morning and Woolsey's talking about business, you know, of the day and and what have you. And um, yeah, I think that's I think that's amazing. So there are some hidden bits in Hampton Court that um, I think just allow you to expand the story and and and, and we haven't lost all that we think we have. Um, mm. And I don't know whether you want to talk about it now, but there are plans afoot 
to actually make some of those areas open again. Yeah. Tell me about, tell me about those projects. Well, I think this is, um, this is Tracy Borman, who's currently co-curator at Hampton Court Palace. She is desperately wanting to um, open up some of Henry's privy, most secret chambers, which are the um, kind of, in, there's, there's, there's a, even beyond where I was, there's a, a tower called the Bain Tower or the Bath Tower. And again, none of this is accessible to the general public. Um, and she was really trying to see Puppin, um, which would be completely amazing. Um, it's, um, it's not without its challenges because Hampton Court has been so, I go back to that word, messed with over time that just the, the sheer practicalities of, you know, they've got some, they've got these tiny little lifts that get you you know like behind the scenes where where the staff go but the public don't you know they've got these tiny little lifts that get you from one floor to another it's just it's so impractical there's so much to do from mm. a kind of a visitor point of view but mm. I think it's I just think it's brilliant um that Tracy is trying to do this because not only will it open up some of Henry's rooms um mm. In that wing, Henry's, uh, the ground floor, when Wolsey first built Hampton Court, the ground floor was occupied by Princess Mary. Mm -hmm. The first floor was occupied by the king. And then the floor above that was occupied by the queen. So this would have been lived in by Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour. And of course, Jane Seymour gave birth to Edward VI in that range of rooms and the room in which which was her bedroom which was the queen's bedroom also survives mm -hmm. um and uh, it's got a beautiful huge tudor fireplace and again it's currently used as a meeting room but i think that's another one of the rooms that tracy is desperate mm -hmm. to open up yeah. so wouldn't that be spectac spectacular yeah that might then have been the room where she died then yes. if it was yeah. yeah it is yeah yeah. So I, I don't know how they're going to do this and, and, and how they're going to recreate it, uh, but it would be amazing to open those rooms again. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly a good reason to book a visit. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I remember I interviewed her a couple of years, maybe two years ago now, and she said that she thought it was at least seven years in the future, five to seven years or something like that. So it's, it's not going to be like, don't book a trip next week. No, <laughs> no, abs absolutely not. But it is something to look forward to. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so then can you tell me, yeah, tell me about like everybody loves that haunted gallery. What can you tell me about the haunted gallery and just kind of the, the um, more, I don't know, um, spookier parts of Hampton Court? So it's, it's formal name is the Upper Cloister Gallery. And um, it, it, you know, it connects. The formal name isn't the haunted gallery? Or... I'm, afraid, I'm afraid not. <laughs> um it's a, you know, it was built by Wolsey to connect one part of the palace to the other. Of course, you get access or the king and the queen um, had access to their holy day closets from the haunted gallery. And you can go into those spaces today and look down over the chapel and that amazing 1536 ceiling, which, you know, is just utterly spectacular. Um, and so, you know, things happened in those holy day closets. Uh, one of them, just before we get onto the haunted gallery, was example, you know, for example, of course, Catherine Parr married the king in, those, in, the, in the queen's closet there. So there's not much of the original interiors. It's just part of one ceiling has the original Tudor ceiling in what would have been the queen's holy day closet. Um, but anyway, you know, the story goes, of course, is that gallery is haunted by the ghost of um, Catherine Howard who um, had, of course, been arrested on, you know, her suspected charges of, of, of adultery and treason and so on and so forth. And she managed to break away from her guards and run down the corridor, trying, I, presu I presume, that I, I, if I remember rightly, it is to reach the king in his holy day closet. And of course, she was caught and she was dragged back. Um, and she never made it, but her ghost is still said to haunt the gallery, screaming for Henry's mercy. Um, mm. 
Yeah, sadly, as, as far as I know, there's, there, is, <laughs> there is no uh, evidence that she did actually run down that corridor, but it makes for a great story. And, and I think there's, um, you know, when I was last there, one of the guys was saying that there is a cold spot around, around there that people do pick up on. So, mm-hmm. you know, whether there is some other ghostly impression, who knows? Do you like, do you, uh, you like ghost stories, Heather? Um, yeah, a little bit. I do. Um, do you know any others about Hampton Court? No, not about Hampton Court. I saw ghosts at Gettysburg one time. That's all. That's my only ghost story. Okay. Yeah. N- I've never seen ghosts in, in the UK, <laughs> but, uh, saw some ghosts at Gettysburg once. Wow. Um, but I don't know any, any other Hampton Court ones. That's, that's no. the one that I've, that I've ever heard. Um, so let's see. Uh, tips for visiting. We kind of went over that. Um, what's, what's your, have we already talked about your favorite part of Hampton court or is there something? It's that so hard, isn't it? Cause it's like all of it. <laughs> it's all of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, my favorite part, I think it, it is, we probably have talked about it. I think the great hall, just because it just, Oh, I just, I, I love going in there and just soaking up the vibe and, and letting my imagination run away with me. So I think I think that's probably is my my favorite part. But of course, then there's the real tennis courts, which are also really interesting and I think oh. easily missed because, you know, you have to go outside and go through the gardens and and the fact that they're basically untouched and, you know, was as they were and people are still playing tennis as Henry and Charles Brandon and all the others once played you know you can go in there and you can watch the tennis in progress and um Mm. that can take you on a bit of a time travel as well so I kind of rather enjoy that I had to go on the I had to go on the courts once it's really difficult (laughs) it's really tough yeah because it's not like the tennis that we play at all right I mean it other than the fact that there's a racket and a ball that's kind of but there's no bounce on the ball. It's really dead. It hits the racket in a really dead way. And of course, you, you're supposed to, you serve up onto that. And I can't remember the names of the, but there's like a, pe- a pentis roof that runs around. Maybe that's what it's called. Um, you serve up on that. It's very, yeah, it's, it, it was really hard. I wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions that you want to um, to ask Sarah, just feel free to chat them in here. Or um, I can. There's only seven of us here, so I can unmute people as well. Yeah. Um, or not raise your hand or something. Um, yeah. But uh, I'm trying to see what other questions I have here for you. So. Um, tips for visiting your favorite. We talked about the different rooms and what. We also talked about the rooms that you can't see, uh, that you can't visit. Were there any other, what would you love to be able to see that you can't see right now? Like what, what is there that you know is in Hampton Court that you wish was open well, that's not? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really around those, the clock court. I mean, I'd love to see, I'd, as I said, I'd love to see an ambulance lodging. So I've been, I've actually been into Henry's old presence chamber. I have, um... I've been into the Queen's bedchamber. Um, there is, by the way, on the on the 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 old entrance to the Queen's bedchamber. Uh, the, the Queen's chambers still exist. It's a this beautiful again Tudor arch doorway, and the spandrels are, are sort of uh, decorated with various you know Tudor motifs. And it's such a grand doorway, and and the surroundings are oh you know they, they, it's just all the all the other interiors have been ripped out, but you just know you were walking into a grand space. So I've been in all of those. Um, I'd love to get into Anne Boleyn's um, old chambers, and the mm-hmm. other thing again, you see, I I've got a bit of a fascination with with lost parts. So I don't know whether you know where the Wolsey rooms are. Can you can you um. You have to, you don't, you get at it from clock court. Um, it's, it's, uh, you kind of got to go behind the Georgian palisade and the Wolsey rooms are upstairs. And these were a suite of rooms that were occupied by Wolsey and possibly also Catherine Parr and um, Mary, Lady Mary, Mary Tudor, as in Henry's daughter at various points. 
but that's a very authentic suite of rooms. It's often used as an exhibition space. And, and, and if it wasn't for coronavirus, we would be uh, approaching the opening of their big exhibition for this year, which is the Field of Cloth of Gold exhibition, which would have been in those, in the, in those rooms. Um, oh, it will come. I, I, I understand it will come. Um, but it's going to be delayed until later on in the year. But they've got, sounds like some amazing, fabulous exhibits going into there that have never been seen before in public, which would be great. But one of the things I love is if you um, chamber, then a smaller room, and then you've got, you've got a small corridor with a couple of closet rooms, smaller, smaller rooms, you know, typical Tudor prog progression from the larger room to the progressively smaller rooms. And in the last room, I, I don't know whether, whether um, folk listening or watching can have been and can remember, there's a, another bricked up Tudor doorway and it's got, and it did have all the names of Catherine of Aragon's lost child, children, you know, the ones she'd miscarried and still birth, and they're all listed. But what I, again, what I found out was that that doorway once led to the great long gallery at Hampton Court, which was in its day, enormous i mean it's a was a spectacular spectacular gallery um probably a couple of hundred feet long you know um looked out over the gardens it had at the end these beautiful turrets with these onion domes with the gilded and it just that's mm. gone but you know i often i kind of want to close my eyes and just i am i if i think wish hard enough i'll just walk through that door <laughs> <laughs> and into that gallery <laughs> and take a lovely long stroll down it <laughs> um so um, if you did do something like that though i mean sorry? honestly it wouldn't you wouldn't it be frightening if you did wish hard enough and then you were there that yeah you'd really probably <laughs> really panic wouldn't you <laughs> but wow. unfortunately that whole gallery was was lost with um uh, the later renovations so it was the whole thing was torn down but there was a chamber at the end of it called I think it was Paradise Chamber which just mm. by the name makes you want to see it doesn't it yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's the Paradise Chamber yes that's right because there's a in Whitehall the gallery had the guilt chamber off the gallery again another name that just makes you want to see inside it and that was named the guilt chamber because it was full of guilt you know of gold um Wolsey's gold before Henry took it over but um so yeah I've probably gone completely off topic but that tends to what happens when I <laughs> when I start talking about places like this that's fine um Barbara chatted and she said it's so great listening to you talk Sarah I'm tuning in as I'm working from home I think a oh. lot of people are hello working. Barbara nice to see you thank you very much for tuning in yeah um can I ask you a question? This is not completely related to Hampton Court, but it's something that I wonder as I read about places because Henry VII built up Richmond Palace, mm -hmm. which is close to Hampton Court. Do you, right, I mean, relatively. Do you know, you know like, how the, did Henry VIII spend much time at Richmond Palace after he acquired Hampton Court? Because they seem like maybe competing palaces. I mean, I, he spent he he definitely had his slight favorites hampton court you know greenwich was definitely his favorite in the early part of his reign it was linked up with eltham it was close to eltham palace he spent a lot of time there and that was sort of in the early part uh, the 20s the early 30s then later in the 30s and the 40s the whole court basically migrated westwards towards hampton court and and i would say you know, it seems Hampton Court probably became one of his most favoured palaces. But, you know, the court moved all the time with the seasons and they definitely. So Greenwich was typically the place that they spent Christmas when Parliament was open. Henry would be based at Whitehall. Often you see the court leaving on summer progress from Windsor, probably because it was the most westerly of those main Thames palaces. And so if they were heading off towards Oxfordshire and so on and so forth, it, it would make sense that they, they left from the most westerly palace. Um, and Richmond, I think he certainly, he certainly did use Richmond, absolutely, um, for sure. Um, 
um, Richmond, uh, the, the event that always jumps to mind with Richmond for me, and you know I'm an Anne Boleyn fan, was that was where uh, Wolsey arrived back off his embassy and uh, Henry was with Anne Boleyn and Wolsey asked to see Henry and, um, and basically, you know, he didn't want to have an audience in front of Anne, but of course Anne was like, well, you know, come where the king is. And uh, I think that was the first time the penny really dropped for Wolsey that... that um, mm. He yeah. might have underestimated her. <laughs> so yeah, he did. He did. He did use it. Yeah, and of course, I think you know it became a um, very popular palace for Elizabeth later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so Barbara says I do have two questions. Um, is there anything interesting uh, facts about the kitchens that you can share? Um, mm. The kitchen those stories too, because everybody loves a good two. I know. God, I know. I don't know any too many more ghost stories. Um, the kitchens, you know, I have to be really honest. I I like glamour and glitz, and I tend to put most of my attention uh, in the more glamorous spaces of the palace. So, um, I'm not. It's the kitchens and the kitchen area and all the offices associated with that. Other than being aware of the different offices and the, you know, it's just like its own little complex. It was only its own little town down there, wasn't it? Really. Um, other than that, it's not. It's not somewhere that I've researched a lot. So I don't know whether I can give you any other facts about it. But maybe you can, Heather. Now, there's a documentary that Historic Royal Palaces has on YouTube. I think just about the kitchens. I don't know how long. I don't think it's like a full hour long documentary, but it, I can stick a link to that in once I find it. Um, but I remember having come across that at one point. They do an amazing job there because they often have reenactors in the kitchens as uh, people probably will know. And there's usually cooking going on. And I've I've been down there when they've been making a, a March pane gilded galleon, you know, so a piece of March pane in the, in the shape of a ship, you know, and they're, they're doing all the, using all the authentic um, methodology to create these dishes. So I said, it's a great vibe down there. Um, and, and they do a great job. The kitchens do a fantastic job. Mm. I'm just looking up Hampton court kitchens to see if I can find this document and put it in. Um, Here's Hampton Court Secrets of Henry VIII's Palace. Maybe that's what I was The thing to note, what, one thing maybe to say about kitchens, it, it, just generally speaking, is that the king would not have had food from the kitchen, those kitchens. The king and queen had their own privy kitchens, usually uh, sited close to their privy chambers. So he had, would have had his own um, cook um and and of course i i you know imagine the food would have been sampled etc cetera, etc cetera. so there was a completely separate kitchen gotcha. for the monarch. gotcha yeah and so then ghost stories we're just gonna you, we're, we're just gonna so say we don't have any other good I, I i wish natalie was here she she's really into her ghost stories you know natalie gruniger uh she's really into her ghost stories um but um yeah i don't know so many i'm afraid <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, I don't know that there's any other questions right now. Um, Barbara said that's okay. So yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, so, oh, did Tina have a question? I just want to thank you and nice to meet you. And thank you, Heather, for putting this together. Yeah. Um, thank how, you. How much, how much of the palace is actually open for tours? What, like, 50%, 75%? Yeah. It's too, um, there are a lot more. Uh, yeah. There are a lot, yeah, I don't know the exact figure, although Tracy was saying something to, to me about this. There are a lot more behind the scenes rooms. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking maybe 50%, something like that, because there's a lot of, you know, it used to be a big go later on post Tudor, Grace and Favour apartments. So there's lots of, there's lots of apartments and rooms everywhere that just simply aren't open. So, it, you know, it, you're not seeing by any stretch of the imagination anywhere near the whole palace right. uh, when you go. Although having said that, you can easily spend a whole day there. There's just so much to kind of drink in. I was going to say too, Tracy does a great job in her book describing how the inner palace worked in terms of the food from the kitchens and yeah. who got what and how it was laid out. It really describes it really well. 
And, and just on that note, actually, just to say that um, the first two episodes of my podcast, which I were, gosh, um, about a year and a half ago now, the first episode was Jonathan Foyle, who used to be curator of Hampton Court Palace and talking about Wolsey's Hampton Court. So he very much feels that Henry VIII gets all the credit for Hampton Court. And actually, you know, it, it was Wolsey, really. And he, he talks in that podcast about Wolsey's Hampton Court and about its development and how Wolsey developed and why he developed it like that. Um, so that's worth listening to. And then in the second episode, we, we also have Tracy Borman talking also about Hampton Court. So the first two episodes of the Tudor Travel Show, you would get more information from two people who have worked on and bases there. Right. And look how that segues into me telling you to give us all of the places where people can find you. Yay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pen and paper ready. Uh, <laughs> the main, yeah, excellent. Um, the, the, main, the main blog is www.thetudortravelguide.com. Thetudortravelguide.com. All lowercase, no hyphens or anything. And you can search for my blog um, for you know, all the blogs that I've written. I focus on Tudor places and artifacts, and that's what I write about. So I, I do try and link places with people and events, but my, my, my primary focus uh, is, on, is on the places and about helping people learn about and unlock the secrets of and get tips for visiting places. So that's the blog. Um, my YouTube channel, if you search the Tudor Travel Guide, you will find me on YouTube. And I'm putting a lot more um, time and energy and effort into YouTube ever more. So I'm publishing more and more videos now. Um, I do a series called the A to Z of Tudor Places, and we are currently on number C, uh, letter C. So that just started at the beginning of the year. And uh, I, I'm going to be doing more and more um, posts coming up and in fact I've just announced I literally devised this last week and I've started writing it I'm doing a seven-day virtual tour of some of the Tudor hotspots in London um, I, as I say it started writing it yesterday we're going to be going to Greenwich we're going to be going to the Tower we're going to be going to St Bartholomew the Great and the Charter House will be Whitehall Westminster Abbey and Hall and Hampton Court Palace and I think that's it um, so um, they will be coming as videos. I also have a podcast called The Tudor Travel Show and you can find that on Podbean. So if you went to Podbean or if you prefer um, iTunes or Spotify, you can just search The Tudor Travel Show and you will find me there. And then I'm on all social media. Usually you can find me as The Tudor Travel Guide. Awesome. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. the time. So I don't think this actually ever made it live to Facebook. I always just said preparing. So okay. that's fine. This was like the first time. So what I'm going to do, it is recording. So I'm just going to get it um, posted in the group. Then some more people can look at it. And then I'll send you a link too if you want to share it around to your yeah. people too. So everybody can learn yeah. more. Can I just mention, can I just mention my books and um, guides, actually? Uh, just to say for those people who don't know me, uh, there are two books in the footsteps of Anne Boleyn and in the footsteps of the Six Wives of Henry VIII, which basically um, focus on, the first book is all the places that Anne Boleyn visited and lived in. So there's 70 properties that Natalie and I talk about in detail, putting her life in the context of the places. And then we um, did the second book in the footsteps of the six wives where we focus on the sort of the top 10 locations associated with each of Henry's wives. And then in my shop on the blog, I'm in the process of creating a series of digital mini guides. So these can be used if you are um, wanting to plan to visit places and you want more of the detailed explanation because what I often find, you know, for example, with somewhere like Hampton Court, they have to cover the whole breadth of history. And, and as Tudor lovers, sometimes we just want to go into the detail and know all the nitty gritty and the ins and outs of the Tudor bits. And so I tend to, wherever I'm writing about, I hone in on the Tudor bits. So there's a growing number of guides. Um, you've got your day out guides, your Tudor day out at, um, and then you've also got, if you want a weekend away, you've got your Tudor weekend away in London, your Tudor weekend away in Suffolk, et cetera, where I put together some of my favorite hotspots if you have a weekend away available to you. 
So thank you for that, Heather. Thank you for letting me mention that. And you also are available for personal tours too. Oh yeah, that's true. Yes. So, God. so yes, I um, yes, I am. Um, this this year, I'm teaming up with British History Tours, and I'm running a mini 1535 progress. Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII did a grand progress in 1535. They went through large swathes of the the country, and I'm taking a snippet of that tour. And we're going to be touring through the main locations that Henry and Anne stayed at in Gloucestershire. So the likes of Sudley Castle, we're going to Tewkesbury and Gloucester, we're going to Barkley Castle, we're going to Thornbury Castle and the wonderful Acton Court. And that's happening in September. Um, and then I also run um, just weekend, I'm doing for the first time this year, if this coronavirus thing lets me and if it doesn't I'll be doing it next year anyway I live like a Tudor weekend so um Brigitte Webster who you mentioned um has a beautiful house near uh, in Norfolk uh it's a, an early 16th century house and she 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 runs Tudor breaks Tudor holidays and I'm teaming up with her and we're going to have a very special weekend at the end of August where we'll be dressing like Tudors, we'll be finding out about Tudors, we'll be eating like Tudors, we'll be doing archery, we're going to go to Kentwell, which is the largest reenactment, Tudor reenactment, probably in the world, and certainly the most authentic. And that's going to be all wrapped up in a weekend at the end of August. And again, if coronavirus gets in the way of that, then we will look to do something else next year. Yes, yeah, so there's a whole raft of stuff going on. <laughs> related to tutor places and travel that's you that's so. me <laughs> awesome well thank okay. you so much and it was so nice to see some familiar faces so yeah. um carol ann's been to tutor con T tina was at tutor con so okay. um anyway it's nice to to see to see friends and uh i yeah. hope this was fun for people to you know just try and I'm just trying to bring some socialness to, to our <laughs> quarantine lives right now um so anyway um we'll, I'll be back on Monday with Michael Ratty and then I'm working out some more for next week but thank you Sarah for being part of this and for being the guinea pig because of course I didn't figure out the Facebook live and you're the first one so there we go thank you for being willing to, to be Most part welcome. of it. thank you for inviting me yeah. Yeah, I know. And thanks for sharing your, your knowledge and your depth of research and everything. So stay well, everybody, and, uh, and take care of yourselves and wash your hands and elbow bumps and everything. Like <laughs> don't touch your face. Yeah, don't touch your face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you. Good to Bye. see you guys. Bye.